and then learn like what it feels like to apply to ourselves. And I think something, if you bring to mind something that you're struggling with right now that's not huge, and just simply say to yourself, may I be happy, may I be free from suffering, may I find peace and joy, and to be able to feel that, that gift to yourself, that warmth, that loving, lovingness towards yourself. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome everyone to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com and as always, it's my honor and pleasure to be with you here tonight on another brand new episode. And of course, I forgot to mention, find all the other episodes at understandingautoimmune.com. And tonight we have a return guest just checking in to see how she's doing and all the amazing things she's doing. She's one of these, I'll call a perpetual learner. I just love that about her because she's so curious and she's been doing some pretty amazing and fantastic things. I wanted to check back in with our dear friend. We call her Simone G, but her real name is Simone John Giordano. (laughs) That's why we call her Simone G. Anyway, she's a lifestyle and business coach and an encourager. I love that about her. And she lives near the ocean and loves the ocean. And she posts the most amazing ocean pictures. (laughs) Anyway, that's, I digress. And she really believes in the courage to say, I can't and how it will set you free. And when I first heard that from Simone, I was like, wow, that is so like counterintuitive. But she described it to us in a way, you can go back and check some of our old podcasts from Simone about that, because we're going to talk about that a little bit, but something else that she's doing right now. And Simone has invisible health challenges that impact her quality of life. And Yet she's found ways to overcome all of that. These invisible health challenges can be really tough. She gives voice that societal and cultural norms have been far more limiting than any of these limitations that we have. So it's all about sharing compassion and how we can overcome many of the misconceptions that people with invisible illness or invisible health challenges have. And so we're all about overcoming the stigma of chronic health challenges. And we'll get more into Simone's amazing bio because I want to bring her on. Welcome back to the show, Simone. It's so good to see you. Thanks, Sharon. It's wonderful to be here again. And I just want to touch base when you said about learning. You wouldn't know this. Learner is my top strength on the Gallup or Clifton strengths. I know it's changed names, but learner is my number one strength. Not at all surprised. <laughs> Not at all surprised. (laughs) I think I would have been surprised if you told me differently. (laughs) And that's what we love about Simone, because she's always challenging the norms. And I love that. She's always about like, well, yeah, but that doesn't make sense. Why, Why can't we do it this way? And one of the things that she's been doing of late is what does compassion really mean? And as I told you, she's a learner. She always takes it to the 27th degree there. And she became a compassion trainer. And I said, Simone, tell me more. (laughs) I think that's so fascinating. First, Simone, let's get into the word. How do you define compassion? And and we'll talk about learning all about how to be a compassion trainer as well. But how do you define compassion? Wonderful. Just a quick clarification is I'm not 100% certified yet. I'll be completing my practicum, which is taking up to 20 people through the program. And then I will earn my final certification to become certified. I have completed extensive training really in depth. So how do I define compassion? There, there's so many ways to look at it. And I might answer this differently on different days. But in general, I think of compassion as take out all my training and everything. I think of compassion as soothing or suffering. And that is actually what it is. Compassion is around suffering. 
but to take it further, like you said, I like to take things to the 10th degree or whatever is. <laughs> I expanded to 27, but 10th works. <laughs> let, let me touch base first more, like, you know, being compassionate to ourselves. If you're tired, for example, pushing through, if you don't absolutely need to, like pushing through your work or something isn't necessarily being compassionate to yourself because you might have repercussions, especially of health challenges of having more symptoms. And even if you don't have health challenges, you know, what would a 10 minute break do or a 10 minute rest or an hour nap, depending on where you are in your journey, what you and your body needs, what's a compassionate act to yourself. And that kind of brings me towards a more expanded definition. So what's it take for compassion to exist? There has to be awareness. And if we're rushing around, distracted by social media, or just so focused on something that's maybe irritating us or something, we aren't really being aware. So mm -hmm. where to be aware, we kind of have to slow down, settle our minds. And if you're familiar with emotional IQ, you know, a lot of that is respond, don't react. How do you respond, not react? You need a little pause. You need a little nanosecond, 10 seconds, whatever it is to have that awareness and stop, stop like not responding in anger, not responding in irritation. And then it's, we need to have empathy. We need to be able to feel that we are suffering. A friend is suffering, a loved one suffering, or somebody is suffering. There's being aware and then it's having that feeling of they're having a hard time. And a lot of times people think that's compassion, but that's where empathy stops. That's actually just empathy. I don't want to say just because it's really, really important <laughs> to be able to, and to feel and to see somebody's pain and suffering, to hear someone's pain and suffering. But then we also have to have an intent, um, intention or desire to see ourselves suffer less, see a loved one suffer less and so forth. I was thinking about this this morning. So we haven't really practiced compassion yet. We feel the person's pain, but sometimes we have that intention and don't practice compassion. And we might be distracted by this thing, <laughs> social media or the phone, you know, distracted. So we might intend, but we don't do it. If something stops us. There's so many addictions out there. It's not just drugs and alcohol. I mean, sometimes it's even being addicted to bitterness or, or to the news on bias and so forth. So basically there's an awareness that there is suffering. There's this feeling that this person or yourself is suffering. Then there's intention. And then it's like the actual act or to being motivated to do something to lessen it. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's means compassionate act. I mean, if you just take that out to that's doing a compassionate act, or it could be as simple as may I be happy saying, may I be free from suffering? That's also doing something. So another example might be compassion and act is setting boundaries. Maybe there's a relationship that there are issues that are impacting your well-being or your ability to do something. You might need to set a boundary around that. that and that could be a compassionate act towards yourself. Actually, compassion and act towards the other too. Sometimes it may not feel that way towards the other person, but I know in boundaries, once a boundary is set, then the ground rules can change. And I think that's the important part that a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to set a boundary. It seems so, you know, one sided or something like that. I'm like, you know, if you're shocked, confused, annoyed, whatever it is, and somebody's pushing you to do something you don't want to do. Yes. Then saying no is an act of compassion before it escalates beyond that. But some people are afraid to say no. It can be said in other words. It just doesn't mm -hmm. be a bland no. But yeah. I think boundaries are really important. Even with medical professionals, I know I've had to say that might work for some, but that doesn't work for me. Let's come up with a different idea. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So boundaries could be a starting point. I mean, most things in life are dynamic. And another thing that compassion does, one of the great um, benefits is the relationship with yourself and your relationship with others. So if through compassion, being able to see somebody suffering or, or to be able to listen to them and even just being present, like I like the saying, be present, not perfect. Being present, in, it can improve the communication 
And, and that's connection. I mean, to me, compassion brings about connection with another person or yourself. So through that connection, improved connection, I can, like what you said about boundaries being flexible, they can, yeah, the, the better your communications become, the more you can actually, if, if it's a relationship boundary, there's all so many different boundaries, uh, types of boundaries. If it's a relationship boundary and you're talking and seeing and listening and practicing compassion, then you could in time potentially have such boundaries just slip away. Absolutely. Based on where you're at. I also focus a lot on boundaries around business too, for your well-being. So there's so many different types. And it's a skill. And it's mm -hmm. like you said, it's not, doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the more you get used to and comfortable setting boundaries, the easier it becomes. Yeah. And boundaries can be flexible as long as they're okay, you're okay with that. Sometimes mm -hmm. out of frustration, you can have the intention of setting a nice, I'll put in air quotes, calm or nice boundary, but maybe mm -hmm. it comes out harsh because there's some frustration. So, you know, boundaries can be a little bit flexible. Yeah. And, and I think too, it's like, you know, when I talk about boundaries, I'm not talking about, oh, I'm so angry about that situation. Or I'm angry at that person. I'm setting this boundary. I'm looking at it from a perspective of, Hey, have an awareness. There's an issue here or I need to do something to better take care of me or, or to not enable somebody. So it comes from a, a place of wanting to support your own well-being, support, um, perhaps living a life of purpose. I mean, it just comes from a different place of cut off. It comes from a place of really hope the more we can connect it from the perspective of love you know caring for yourself caring for another person and that's kind of you know we, we touched base on soft front strong back that's an example where a really really tough boundary could come from a place from that kind of place so for example say a parent has a loved one who a, a child who's addicted to drugs, alcohol, whatever the addiction is. If you've watched intervention, you know, they talk a lot about enabling and I haven't been in that situation. It has to be heart. So, so such a heartbreaking situation to be in at times, but sometimes setting that boundary is that being resilient, having that strong, strong back to allow that person to walk their own journey. Describe a little mo bit more. I think we glossed over the idea a little bit of the soft front and strong back. Uh, that was a great example. I'm also seeing where someone might be saying with the soft front idea, maybe they're feeling at what point I don't want to appear so soft that I'm a pushover and then the surprise, I have this strong back and I come back fierce or ferocious. So like, can mm -hmm. we do this idea of what is soft front strong back? Because I think people might be a little confused about how do I do yeah. that? The, the example I use, that's a really tough situation that um, a professional in addiction counseling would probably be well suited to help with. So if we take the situation to something more around the perspective of, you know, a work situation, a challenging work situation, something that's not so life changing. Well, let's say um, a at work, somebody that always talks too much in the meeting or, you know, doesn't let the other team members talk. Okay. Or, I mean, not a bully yeah. like your life is threatened, but yeah. just somebody you get annoyed at. Okay. <laughs> so soft front itself is being open, being warm, the ability to be vulnerable and vulnerability takes courage to yeah. share. I mean, we, we know that, right. It's, it's, um, in fact, my song courage to be you, that was very vulnerable thing for me to share from a health challenge perspective. So it takes vulnerability, which takes courage. So that's that soft, warm front. The strong back is really walking in integrity, knowing your values. That's one way to look at it. So it's not allowing, or at least trying not to allow set, trying to set some boundary there that you're going to be here with a presence that this person's not going to just be welcome to walk over you. Another way to look at it too, is you could see when it, how easy it would be to get defensive with somebody. 
Oh yeah, that's to, super right. Easy. <laughs> defensive area, you know, that sometimes that's like a facade of a strong can be a facade of a strong front. You're not going to, you know, this, that like in your face, really irritated anger. I think we're times. seeing that hyper exposed, that, that aggressive, in fact, not strong. I think I will say that aggressive front. Mm -hmm. So that's opposite of a soft, open, understanding, vulnerable, authentic front, warm, caring, tender, but you can see how it might feel like through that defensiveness that you're protecting yourself. One of the things I like to do and when I'm getting those, well, my, my family's, oh, she's getting her hackles up. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have learned that some nice deep breaths help me recenter mm -hmm. and calm my mind down so yes. I can find those tools of the resilience and the ability to stand in my presence and in, stand firm and still see the other person's side of it or yeah. be able to come to a mutual meeting of how can we resolve it. But sometimes I have to slow myself down by deep breathing. From a healthcare perspective, thinking of a couple situations where this kind of come could have come into play. In hindsight, how could I have advocated better for myself? Oh, so, I think that's a common one. I hear that yes, how, on the show. I wish I would have, but now I know too, or I could have, yes. should have, would have. That's a shame. So for here, you know, with the purpose of your show and everything uh, around autoimmune and other health challenges and so forth, it can be intimidating, especially after a few times to go to a doctor who doesn't seem to be listening, who doesn't seem to be seeing or really hearing what you're saying. So that's kind of a lack of connection, a lack of compassion. And we know there's all kinds of systems and insurance and requirements and, and training that come into play in that. So to show up, what would it look like to show up to advocate for yourself? And what comes to my mind is that, that strong back aspect. That's just having that confidence in communicating with the doctor. So when I think back to this time after I fell four days after honeymoon and I knew I broke my ankle, but I also had significant back and neck injuries. Four days after my honeymoon, I couldn't shower myself. I couldn't dress myself. So my husband had to do all that, right? Get me dressed, get me showered. I could not do it because I couldn't lift my arms. When going to the doctor, I knew you learn, keep it short and focused to a point. <laughs> if you really went up with something, right? And he looked up at the wall and I had one little tiny tear start to form. And he said, why are you crying? <laughs> and I just oh shut God, down. That sounds like a teacher that just takes me back to a <laughs> kindergarten teacher. I shut down. It wasn't even a tear the whole way down my cheek. And I vowed just to never go back. And I didn't for four years. What could I have done with a strong back? Being, you know, more addressing my needs. And that's what compassion helps us do. Compassion to ourselves is help us know, be aware of, and support our own needs, our well-being. I could have said, excuse me, did you actually hear what I said? Maybe he had a fight with his wife that day and didn't even hear me because I only said a few sentences. You know, there's different things like that just to call attention and stand up for yourself in a way that advocates confidently and calmly. Um, that kind of really draws the person in to interact with you. Or maybe I could have said something along the lines, do you understand I cannot lift my arms? And specifically ask, can you send me for a test and see what is said there? But it's so easy to just kind of do this because you're already in so much pain. You might be having symptoms. I know I was having cognitive symptoms. I was having trouble processing things because of the injury. So I wasn't on my A game. So that's where somebody else could have helped, you know, if they were there along with me. I like to take notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like when I'm going to see the doctor, the list might be a little long and convoluted and doesn't <laughs> make sense, but yeah. I still want to get all of those points out. So I yeah. take a pad of paper and I write them down before the appointment and sometimes for days before the appointment, like, oh, mm -hmm. this just happened. I want to be able to remember to tell them that. Right. And the efficient... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, really efficient. And then be able to refer back to that page and say, look, how do these four symptoms work together? It doesn't make sense to me and have yeah. someone explain it to you. And sometimes having that third place to look at, like my piece of paper, 
-hmm. It takes a lot of the emotion away. The paper's being the bad guy. It's the one with the list of all the symptoms and the and the problems, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it gives a, a, a point of focus. Yeah, but it, it, it's tough situations, but there's real life applications. Yeah. Think of a perspective of somebody like protecting your child. Someone says or does something that could be harmful. You're going to want to stand up for your child. You're going to want to have that fierce compassion come out there. <laughs> Why is it so hard to style? stand up for our own inner child, <laughs> Simone? I mean, I love the example of child because, yeah, I, I don't really like the term. It's been rather... Yeah ruined, but I am a mama bear about yeah. children. I've often wondered why is it so hard to find that inner mama bear for my own inner child? Our society really has in honored that level of true self-care, that level of taking the time to be aware of our needs. I, I don't think a lot of us truly know our needs because we keep busy. It is easy to busy we keep ourselves busy. with busyness and not ever... Yeah. Yeah, so you have to slow down to even know the needs. And if you don't know the needs, how do you truly advocate for yourself? I guess these are, I, I'm also reading a book about a, questions are the answers. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm always asking questions <laughs> to myself. <laughs> there I go again. My biggest learning for me to slow down was after I got my graduate degree. There I, I had two small kids. I had my own company and oh, I was getting wow. a graduate degree. And while you're in the thick of it, mm -hmm. you're not really 100% aware what you're doing to your health and your body. <laughs> yeah. I should have been, but I wasn't because I was so busy being busy with all of these things. And then when I got the degree, so then a large part of the busyness went away immediately. You know, that's yeah. done, complete. And that's when I sat down and went, wow, I haven't really allowed myself to honor a true sleep schedule for two years you know I haven't mm -hmm. I haven't eaten the way I should be eating I've been feeding my children and things like that but it was really interesting to me when all of a sudden one of those things that you've been so busy on disappears as quickly yeah. as you know here's your degree you're done it's like wow I've got all this time yeah that I started to realize what I'd done to my health during that two-year process yeah. And, you know, what you're saying there, Sharon, is uh, what I'm kind of hearing also is there are times where we truly are busy. Yeah. And well, it if really, I wanted really, to get it done, I had to be busy. Yeah. You, it's not something that you can easily stretch out without ramifications of, hey, the program might change. Now you got to kind of restart. And that is a path. It's a commitment. And, and giving ourselves compassion is that, hey, I couldn't do everything to take care of my well-being because I was on this path. I made the decision. That can be a perfectly great decision, but it's hard. Then there's the type of busyness when I mentioned it, just keeping busy with TV, keeping busy with watching news, keeping busy just with scrolling, TikTok, Instagram, whatever. Just keep busyness without any real productive output. You are working towards something, a productive output, and there are ramifications. And it's really, it comes back to that whole, like how our societal systems and so forth. It makes it really hard to do that in a balanced lifestyle way. Mm -hmm. I did sit down and have a talk with my kids. Uh, this program only allowed a two week break and I did take mm -hmm. the kids away for vacation. And I sat down with them and realized how much I'd missed them and lost oh, time yeah. with them. During that time, and I told them, I remember very clearly, I told them that I'm, I'm really treasuring our time here. This is important. I've realized how much I lost, how much I missed. I'm going to quit. And boy, did I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, mom, we've suffered too during this time. Mm -hmm. You're going to go get that thing. We are willing to put up with it. And so it was That's really beautiful. Nice there was another boundary, <laughs> other people with a yeah. strong back saying, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've yeah. suffered. We're not going to have that suffer go for naught. <laughs> yeah. You're go get that. that and that really comes great. from a place of guilt, probably, right? To some extent, feeling guilty. For me, yeah, not from my kids, but yeah. Right. They, they were like, right. look, you're not the only one going through this. We're in this as a team, and we're not going to allow you to walk away without getting that thing you said you want. Yeah. So to be like, and guilt, shame, doubt, those are all huge things to give compassion to. 
Absolutely. Those are all huge things to give compassion to. And if you like in that kind of situation, Hey, yes, I am feeling guilty. And even that awareness of it, right? This kind of things kind of eat away at us if we don't acknowledge them. And that's kind of like the whole with my work is like the self-acceptance part of the health challenges, of the impacts of the health challenge. So for myself, I carried a lot of guilt because of my health. You know, big things. I left my career at just over 40. 20 years of savings in a 401k, my entire corporate career of savings from day one kept me alive. And I, I, I work to be grateful for that, but it's gone because of healthcare costs. As newlyweds, we couldn't do things. I couldn't dress myself even, you know? So the impact to our marriage from day four, well, four days after the honeymoon. And I'll share this. This is something I haven't really shared is the day I fell, I had gone to the doctor to see, I was 40, if it was okay to have a baby. And he's like, yeah, you know, you'll be high risk, but we have McGee's hospital right here. And I fell a year later where I thought I finally had got myself. I'd already left my career. I'd been spent six months working on my well-being. And this is a great example of total lack of compassion. The doctor looked, same doctor looked at me and said, you have a baby. Are you crazy? You'll be bedridden. Your baby will be at risk. You'll lose everything. Why would you do that? <laughs> wow. I, you know, so, you know, that's where you that's, take a deep inhale and, and <laughs> shock ensues. I think shock. Exactly. I think the thing about this sort of medical gaslighting and, and lack of compassion, lack of humanity, actually, Mm -hmm. It needs to be addressed because give yourself grace during those times. Yes. Now, never that blatant, Simone, that just took my breath away. Just Yeah, you're kind of shocked. You don't, that's, it's very difficult not to be shocked. And I hadn't, you know, processed this kind of training, these kind of life skills yet. Because I was corporate world, now you didn't focus on, at that time, pre-pandemic compassion and that kind of awareness wasn't really a thing. But yeah, but I but, think you really have to, if you're the patient yes. hearing that kind of stuff, give yourself yes. the grace. Yes. So you walk out of there and then you're like, darn, why didn't I say that? Why didn't I stand up to myself? Yeah. Well, look, you just were shocked, confused and completely annoyed. Nobody yes. thinks well in any of those emotional states. Yes. And if you don't give yourself compassion, if you don't take care of yourself, and that's why I think you so, um, self-awareness, self-acceptance, compassion are some of the absolute greatest things to do for our well-being and for self-care. That is self-care. It's a, it's like a lifestyle of, of, you know, how to cultivate this lifestyle that supports your well-being from that perspective. That led to a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. You know, we were going to start a family and here's the doctor saying, are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. So when you look at it, um, from a uh, within the medical industry, how could he have said that simply? Hey, you know what? Things have changed a lot in the last year. I think you're really at too much risk, and here's why. And I could say then, well, is there any suggestions that I can do that I can take to improve my well-being to that point? Yeah, you know, but that opportunity was taken away because he didn't see me in a caring way. Oftentimes, we think about this idea of giving, cutting them some slack. Well, they're busy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That was just a complete lack of care, empathy, yeah. and compassion uh, to say it that way. There's always a moment to take a deep breath and say to myself, how can I say this in a different way? Mm -hmm. How can I just not lash out? Or I can't even imagine yeah. any place in someone's relationship where you think you have permission. Right. To talk in such a way to someone about yeah. something that's very important to them. Yeah, I think this kind of awareness is very important though, which is why I'm sharing it, because we don't know the environment um, and so forth. I'm not making excuses to give compassion is not condone, just like forgiveness. It doesn't mean you condone, it doesn't make it right. Um, a lot of times it's maybe more for yourself. <laughs> in, in, in a situation like this, I find myself giving compassion more for myself, my own inner peace. But looking at it, this kind of awareness of anybody's in the healthcare industry going, oh my gosh, did I ever do anything? Maybe not at that level, but I think these stories help individuals in the healthcare community realize how much their words can hurt and the ramifications that that can happen on an individual in their life. 
moving forward because shame and guilt, you know, that definitely, that was hard to deal with. So that impacted our relationship with my husband and everything. So everything we do has an impact. Yeah. So that's why I choose to try, <laughs> try, and we don't do perfect, right? <laughs> yeah, as but much as more, we want perfect. <laughs> the more we can embody compassion, peace, and share that, hopefully somebody else picks that up just a little bit in their day and they share it. So it's that outward ripple from there is how I look at life right now. Oh, fantastic. We need to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to learn more from Simone about the compassion teacher training that she's been doing from the Compassion Institute Compassion Cultivation Training Program. Wow, that's a mouthful, Simone. <laughs> it is. <laughs> we'll, we'll be right back. The Autoimmune Hour will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by understandingautoimmune.com to learn more. Ohm Times TV Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a mile, mile in my shoes. shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor, and we're here with Simone. We've been talking about, she spent the last year and or more, actually, uh, doing some amazing compassion training to become a certified compassion teacher. She's almost there, so I'm so excited. But I wanted to check in and see how she was doing and understand more about compassion. I think people have the wrong thought about what compassion is. Oftentimes, I talk to people, and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah but they don't really take it to heart. I mean, sometimes even people think of it as a weakness. So I don't know about those. I try to stay away around those people who consider compassion a weakness. But anyway, Simone, let's talk about, it's a little bit about the teacher training that you're going through and, and how does one become a compassion trainer? I want to make mention, you said from the heart and that's Another way I see compassion, it's having, being able to connect with someone that you do see in a more heartfelt way. It, it, it's just a different kind of connection. It just feels so much more real, so much stronger, so much healthier, so much more authentic. So no facades, just this concept. And this is a lot of the teaching is that we all have suffering and we all have this natural aspiration to happiness. And looking at that from the perspective of, I desire happiness. I want less suffering. And that's really hard to do sometimes. It's not something that we're educated on, that we practice, that we've probably even really thought about a lot of times. But when you start looking at it this way, and then looking at it from the perspective of, Hey, I want to be happy. Hey, Sharon wants to be happy. Sharon has suffering. She wants less suffering. The listeners have suffering. They want less suffering. And then this theme of common humanity, that we all have suffering. We all desire to have less suffering. That's a lot of what the focus is on. And I, I think the work is so, so important 
because we have so many ways to connect as a society now, but in so many ways, I think we're more disconnected than ever. I look at it as optimal well-being requires connection. I think there's multiple studies out there that yeah, absolutely are showing yeah. that, especially since the yeah. pandemic and how we were disconnected yeah. and living in place fear-based yeah. places. Mm -hmm. it's really yeah. important to understand how important connection is to yeah. not only our health, but our well-being and including our mental health. I want to talk about why I wanted to participate in Compassion Institute's program which is compassion cultivation. I went through it, the program as a participant in 2019. And I really started looking at a lot more contemplative practices, or maybe starting to put a name to it in 2018 and caregiving for my father. So that was a huge catalyst. Or <laughs> I can't think of the right word. A catalyst. Uh, <laughs> catalyst to my really focusing more on self-awareness to this connection. And maybe it was through the connection I felt in caregiving. I was very, very fortunate in my dad's passing. I felt inspired and a lot of peace. So, so grateful for the experience I had. And as I started reading more contemplative books and creating my program, which in hindsight, I have self-compassion and compassion all through it and how aligned that is with the Compassion Institute's program. It, what I love about the program is it is evidence-based. They've looked at neuroscience and psychological kind of studies in depth and how contemplative practices such as mindfulness, meditation, compassion, loving kindness, how these practices support a healthier immune system, support less inflammation markers, which if you have autoimmune disorders, you know, that can be a big, big thing can reduce cardiac risk and so forth. It also can strengthen the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system that help can help calm us from a mind perspective, this idea of purpose and well-being and less stress, less anxiety studies have supported the concept that it does lessen depressive symptoms and so forth. And then there's the impact to our relationships with ourselves and with others. So I love this, the fact that they have done a lot of work to make this evidence-based. And the program itself was developed out of Stanford by Thupten Jimpa, who was Dalai Lama's translator for over 25 years and several other founders. So the quality of the program, the learning involved, <laughs> is, as we talked about, that along with, it's a global program now. So there are people from all over the world, which was a wonderful experience from a perspective of being in the teacher training cohort to be working with individuals all around the world. And the, the support was just amazing. So those are some of the reasons why I wanted to do their program in particular. And quite frankly, when I participated, I, I think I was looking at it from the perspective of, hey, if I can support my immune system better, if I can you know, just learn some more skills. But what I didn't realize was how much it was going to really change my approach to life or strengthen the direction I was going, perhaps, to looking at the little impacts we have on other people, to looking at the approach I take to life. And, and, and sometimes it's even putting a name to, I've talked with you, Sharon, about our move to Florida. It was to support my health and well-being in 2016 because my body was shutting down in the cold. I was in and out of the hospital a lot. So choosing this lifestyle that really is about the journey less about the goal of obtaining things, obtaining promotions and uh, that kind of goal oriented. Now I do have goals. <laughs> I like to get things done, but they're aligned with a purpose that I see from having compassion and that awareness. Now I'm curious then I want to, you're just about to get your final certification. I know you've yes. been through the whole process and all of that. Tell us a little bit about what your plans are as you become certified? When I um, applied to be accepted, my goal, and this still is my goal, is to bring this level of support because it has been so, so, so important to my own healing journey. I do believe it has impacted my lab result numbers in a very positive way from my blood work. But so basically, 
I know the stigma that goes around health challenges. I know what it's like to have these situations within the healthcare system that impact your life in a way that isn't fun sometimes, the financial impact. So really to be there to support individuals who do have the health challenges, to work to change you know, through compassion to themselves. I, I talked earlier about a lot of the big suffering I had was very directly related to health issues in a society that doesn't really know how to support it. So to be able to bring this level, to play any role in this level of healing that individuals, I believe, can obtain through the going through this kind of training, the skills that can be applied. When you start learning awareness skills, that applies way beyond your own personal health journey. It applies to your relationships. It applies to your work. The ultimate goal is to work to embody. So it's not, oh, I practice compassion checklist. <laughs> <laughs> I smiled at the doorman today to check. check. <laughs> it, the ultimate goal is to embody it. So through natural inclination, you start to just incorporate it more into your day-to-day, -day, into how you talk to yourself, letting go of that self-critical judgment voice that doesn't do any good and lies half the time. <laughs> half the time you're being generous, but go ahead. Yeah, 99% of the time's lying. <laughs> really, I know the suffering, the second level suffering per se that goes along with health challenges, the suffering on top of the actual physical challenge that's there. It's, it's huge. And then when I talk about the you mentioned when reading my bio about the, the power of a can't, you know, the societal norms, and that can be far more limiting than any limitation we have. It's that second level suffering of being of the of potential feelings of being feeling like, oh, I'm weak. I don't fit in. I don't belong. The stigma, the shame and all that that can go along with so many of the physical health challenges, chronic illnesses and so forth. And the kind of can sneak in over the years <laughs> until you really realize they're there. The anxiety, the fear around further illness, learning to look at this self-acceptance, being a friend to yourself, the loving kindness meta aspect, being, you know, talking to yourself like you would a friend. It really just... It's just like such a breath of fresh air, like a little gentle hug to yourself that it's okay. <laughs> I will get through this. I'm doing the best I can. Beyond that, though, that's still my primary. But I also, once I'm fully certified, meaning I've um, taught my practicum to 12 to 20 participants, is that healthcare professionals can get medical education credits for taking this as well. So, you know, I'm open to opportunities, kind of a little bit of the surrender. Where will this take me? Oh, the open-mindedness, be curious. Where where else can I best serve? Mm -hmm. So I'm leaving that a little open. There's a lot of potential. And I'm going to jump in here and give you a shameless self-promotion plug. It's just <laughs> about reaching out to Simone through her website if you're interested in being one of those 12 to 20 <laughs> participants <laughs> that she's looking for for her certification. I'm going to give you that shameless self plug there. Also wanted to say that I love the interview we did on the power of I can't. It, we'll put a link here in YouTube. Okay. And if you're listening to an audio, go to understandingautoimmune.com and just put type in I can't in the search bar and you'll find it. It was a great interview on the power of saying I can't and the freedom that gives you when you have a chronic illness. You'd say it without any shame, blame, guilt, anything like that. And I think yes. a big way to move through the world and being honoring yourself and the other people in your world. Yeah. It's almost like I can't do that and it's okay. I'm not going to hurt myself anymore. And what I mean by hurt myself is push myself beyond my physical capacities to try to prove that I can, or to just to do things the normal way. And I'm going to find a different way so that I can. But so often we just try to push through, deny the true impact of the health challenges. Like, oh, I can do that. I, and that is eventually, you know, you know, you talked about with your experience with the schooling and so forth. And myself, for my own case, it was, I pushed myself way too hard through my corporate career. And eventually I didn't have anything left to give physically. I struggled to walk 10 feet. 
I want to say it can show mm -hmm. up in little tiny ways too, because just not, I think it was like two, three weeks ago, I went out for a meal with a friend and mm. I really do have serious problems with gluten. I thought, okay, I'm just going to go have a cup of tea while they eat and we can share and enjoy. And I'm fine with that. I don't have any problem just eating yeah. what I need beforehand or after, but it seems like the rest of the world isn't fine with me not eating. When I go to a restaurant, so what did I do? I ordered what I thought would be the safest possible thing. And I don't mm. know how cross-contamination, mm. whatever. I got glutened. Yes, I mm. turned gluten into a verb. Um, and then I was sick for three days. I was down for three days. And yeah. it would have been easier if I had just said I can't and make that a complete statement. Uh, but I didn't. I acquiesced and actually let people shame, blame, guilt me into the fact that I'm out at a restaurant and not eating. Yeah. And that goes back to that strong, strong back concept, being resilient, having the resilience and, and stand advocating for yourself. I can't do that. And if anybody else has quite frankly, a problem with it, it literally is their problem. If, you, if it's just so simple as I can't do that, but I enjoy your company. So I wanted to be here. What's wrong with that? That's wonderful. You're trying to connect. That's good for your well-being. And if somebody has a problem, it literally is their problem. And it's letting go of that self-judgment and, and accepting. Say, I'm still whole. Yeah. And I have to say, you and I can share this. Like it was super easy. And yet I know all this stuff after doing the show for 10 years. And I still yeah. allowed myself to go, oh, okay, Sharon, just to stop all these people yeah. that worried that I'm not eating. It's like, what do you think? I'm going to starve to death in the next 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I, I allowed it to happen. And I yeah. did go into a little bit as I was working through the joint pain and other things that happened to me. I did go through the shame, blame, why did mm -hmm. you, you, you should have blah, 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 blah. So, you know, Simone and I talk about these topics, mm -hmm. but please give yourself space and grace as you yes. practice them because it's not as easy as just talking about it. It, it, it is a lifestyle choice that you're not going to get it perfect. We're not going to get it perfect. And that's like you said, give ourselves grace. You know, I understand why I did it. It's a learning lesson. It's okay. And move on. <laughs> My friends are usually somewhat good. They're like, are you sure? Are you sure? But what I find is the wait staff just can't understand. I, and I'm sure they think they're losing money too, obviously, because mm -hmm. one person's having a cup of tea and the other's one, two, three people having a full-blown meal. Yeah. It's just being able to that nicely, that soft front being nice and understanding and still state your intention with that firm back of saying, no, that won't work for me. Mm -hmm. Great example. So we're just down to about the last five minutes, Simone. I want to give you time for shameless self-promotion, <laughs> talk about the trainings and all the other fun things that you have coming up. Okay. With the trainings, if somebody happens to be interested in participating in the practicum, I would say just go to my website at simoneg.net, N-E-T, and there's a contact form or any social media channel and link up, reach out to me by direct message. And I'll be happy to share more information on that. And down the road, once I'm certified, same thing, I'll eventually probably have an easier way to say, hey, look, so if you're interested, let me know. But it's a great, great program. It really has been transformational in my life. And what I also love about the program, it is self-select. It's not to say, to feel like, oh, I have to do this. It's I'm ready to do this. And I think that's important. And you might not even feel quite ready, but you have an inkling, you know. What I also love is that we're all on our unique journey. And this is very, very much aligned with how I work in general, is we honoring an individual's journey. I don't have all the answers. That's why I help people build a dream team for where there are gaps. Within the compassion training we're all participating. I'm learning there too, as well. We all have such different, unique experiences, perspectives, and a lot of it is about honoring that. How can we honor this in a, you can say safe space, you can say brave space, but really a very supportive environment where we can show up authentically, where we can learn from one another, where we really, it's really an opportunity to do a lot of self-discovery 
And that's what I found for myself, so much self-discovery and taking that and, and just learning about ourselves, learning about how we relate to one another, learning about and being open-minded and curious about what can be in our lives. Ultimately for myself, it really helped me change my relationship with my health. And I think that that analogy can be applied outside of that to changing your relationship with how you relate with others in the workplace, your loved ones, and so forth. Absolutely. And I also want to chime in and I've been sort of serendipitously hopping along the journey with Simone and for our friendship, knowing what she's been doing this past couple of years. And it's been amazing to watch and also to glean from her these safety mechanisms, permission, understanding how self-compassion is healing for ourselves, that a lot mm -hmm. of us grew up with some traumas or created traumas through our life or not. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a self-created trauma sort of misspoke there because it could be trauma from the outside and understanding how we internalize that may not always be helpful. And I find the compassion mm -hmm. training has been helpful in understanding how we internalize the things that happen to us and how we can make them into things that help us grow, help build safety, help us build a way of moving through the world where we're free where we're comfortable and we're not always worried. We're not always afraid. And that's one of the big things I wanted to talk about today is understanding that's part of compassion is understanding how do we cultivate that safety inside ourselves and our permission to be who we are inside ourselves too. I think that's really important. Yeah. This understanding of compassion. Yeah. I like to think of it as the inner balance being grounded, operating from that place of centeredness the clarity that it can bring in our lives from that perspective is, I guess, for lack of better words, I say can be beautiful. Mm, it is beautiful. And understanding that centeredness, sometimes we don't even know where that is anymore, whether it's a medical condition or some other life changing thing happens, challenge happens. Mm -hmm. You're not knocked so far off center that you lose track of where center is. And yes. I, that's what's wonderful about the time and opportunity of a training such as this is to help you refine the center. Because I know when I was diagnosed about 10 years ago, the whole world just, it's like center just fell out from underneath me. Mm -hmm. And yes. so it's taken a while, it's a road back, but it's always well worth it to come back to that place of knowing yourself, giving yourself permission and being centered in your own safety. I think that's one of the wonderful things about compassion and self-compassion. And it's really hard to give compassion if you don't have self-compassion. I don't know if there's studies on that, Simone. Yes. It's my personal <laughs> belief that it's really hard to be compassionate when you aren't self-compassionate. Within the program, we talk about that a lot. The Compassion Institute, we actually, through the training, through cultivating, first practice it with a loved one or it even potentially a pet if you want someone where you access those warm feelings because a lot of people do struggle with self-compassion and that's common it's very common so, so when we each are on our own unique journey there are different fears of compassion there are different types of reservation and so forth and those are all well studied and are addressed in there but sometimes, and it varies by individual, I was uh, someone who actually, I think I was able to lean into self-compassion a little easier at first, but that's not necessarily the norm. And it varies by culture. It's kind of an American thing to some extent. There's other cultures where self-compassion might be easier in general. If I think generally speaking, it's indicated from the studies. And then there's oftentimes though, it's easier to access those feelings with a loved one or a pet and then learn like what it feels like to apply to ourselves. And I think something, if you bring to mind something that you're struggling with right now, that's not huge and just simply say to yourself, may I be happy? May I be free from suffering? May I find peace and joy? And to be able to feel that, that gift to yourself, that warmth, that loving, lovingness towards yourself, then that can really impact, you know, you can just, that's something we can assess throughout the day. Mm, that's beautiful. I think we'll leave it there, Simone. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your compassion journey. I've loved being the observer along the way, and I wanted to share it with everyone else because I found it 
fascinating and I've also found it freeing and the uh, ability to understand all perspectives, I think, is a great thing about compassion is the, the freedom that it gives you and the under yes. depth and understanding that it gives you. So everyone that's Simone G dot net, I'll spell it out for you. S I M O N E G dot net. You can learn more about Simone and her wonderful programs, the I can't program, as well as her upcoming uh, compassionate practicum training program. So everyone have a great week, whatever your adventures and join me next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any